Welcome to the Christ Community Church Sermon of the Week. We are so glad that you've tuned in. It is our prayer that as we preach the Bible, the Holy Spirit would speak to you and that your eyes would be fixed on Jesus. We hope you enjoy. Scripture this morning will be from Acts chapter 4, verses 13 through 22. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves, saying, What should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that this does not spread any further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So they called for them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide, for we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For this sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years old. Thanks be to God. Whew. Good morning, Christ Community Church. How are you all doing this morning? Good, good. Well, if you've not had the uh, pleasure of meeting, my name is Joshua. And I get the honor and privilege of being the senior pastor here at Christ Community Church. And as I say every week, I'm excited because Jesus, the light of the world, is in our midst. And he's going to continue to be with us as we dive into his word today. But if you're new here, maybe you've been coming for a little while um, and you've not quite yet got connected, we would love to know that you are here and a great next step for you. If you didn't uh, take scan the QR code before service on the slide, you can stop by the connection desk after service and fill out a connect card. And uh, we just ask that you stop by, fill out that connect card, turn it into our connection team at the connection desk, and they're going to give you a gift card in return just for filling that out. And I will be out there and I would love to get to know you and to welcome you uh, to our fellowship as a church here at Christ Community Church. Uh, but before we dive into the word, just a few things. First, we want to celebrate. Um, I want to celebrate our lost sheep Easter egg hunt yesterday. Um, we had a lot of kids in attendance. and. Um, we were able to just show so much love uh, to people in our community. Um, we had people, we had pastors from other churches that brought their kids and just a great time just to connect with other pastors and partner with them. Because remember, we are a part of the Capital C Church. And as long as churches proclaim that Jesus is the Savior, they call sin as sin. We're going to partner with them and work together to expand the kingdom of God. Uh, but remember our vision statement. We exist to lead people to Jesus, the light of the world and to be a community of people that are a light in this world. And yesterday, we were a light in our community. So I want it for our volunteers and Sean and Courtney, who planned the entire thing. Let's give it up for them. They did such a great job. Uh, well, as, uh, as we all saw with all the palm branches during our second song of worship, and as Norm read from the Gospel of John, today is Palm Sunday. And uh, Palm Sunday is the day where Jesus entered Jerusalem and was greeted by people waving palm branches. And uh, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And uh, Hosanna actually means, ple means please deliver us. And, and Palm Sunday marks the start of what is often either called the Passion Week or the Holy Week. It was the final seven days of Jesus's earthly ministry. And, and Palm Sunday was the beginning of the end of Jesus's work on earth. And on Friday, I invite everyone out. We're going to be having our Good Friday service uh, at 7 p.m. Good Friday was the day in which Jesus was crucified. It was the day where he was hung on the cross. And on Friday, we are going to just worship Jesus through scripture reading, through uh, communion, worship, and prayer. And the next Sunday, as my last pastor used to call it, uh, is the Super Bowl of Christianity. Uh, it is Easter Sunday. It's the day that Jesus rose from the grave three days after he was crucified on Good Friday. And just want to talk just a moment about Easter service. Um, I don't know if, if you know this, but 82, the stats show that 82% of people that are invited to an Easter service will come. Yet, as we discussed actually on Super Bowl Sunday, uh, get in the game, 
Only 90% of Christians share their faith or invite people, or 90% of Christians don't share their faith or invite people to church. And next week, we're going to take a one-week pause from our expedition through the book of Acts, and we're going to be preaching from Romans chapter 5 on how death was defeated. And, And it is going to be, we preach the gospel every week, but next week through and through is a gospel message. We're not going to have an elaborate Easter program or we're not going to have a performance. We're not going to overcomplicate things. Remember, our our eighth core value is simplicity. We value simplicity because we want the important to remain the important. We're not going to entertain people. We're going to be welcoming of people. We're going to show them love and hospitality. We're going to worship Jesus. We're going to experience God's presence and we are going to preach the gospel. John Calvin once said, if the gospel be not preached, Jesus Christ is, as it were, buried. Therefore, let us stand as witnesses and do him this honor when we see all the world so far out of the way and remain steadfast in this wholesome doctrine. I encourage you this week, invite people that you know to Easter, grab some invite cards from the connection desk on your way out, and let's pack out God's house. And as John Calvin said, let's do God this honor. Let's preach the gospel message for all to hear because Jesus is alive. Amen. It is our job and responsibility as Christians to preach the gospel. And we are believing that many will come to saving faith in Christ next week as we preach the gospel. All glory to God and alone. All glory to God and God alone. So get after it and invite somebody this week. But our culture there for a while was obsessed with the stories of superheroes. Uh, It seemed like every month that there was a new superhero movie coming out. You had the Marvel movies, you had the DC movies. So you had like Iron Man and Captain America and Spider-Man and Black Panther, the Avengers, Batman, Superman, Justice League. The list goes on and on. And I will be honest, you can ask my wife, uh, towards the beginning of this superhero movement, I was one of the people that was all in. Now, honestly, now I could care less if a superhero movie comes out. I really do not care anymore. But before we had kids, we would go to the midnight showings of these movies and we would rock our Captain America t-shirts. Now, my wife, my wife really didn't care for them. She honestly thought the whole thing was dumb, but she was just being a supportive husband, a supportive wife to her husband. Um, but we love these make believe stories of these imaginary heroes that have these superpowers or this knowledge or like Batman have all the money to buy their superpowers. And they do this. We like this because they're using all of these powers to do something good. And as a culture, I think that we, we love to look up to pe- what people would consider the strong, the rich, the educated and the powerful. And And sometimes I think that we think that we must be strong, rich, or educated, or powerful to do something great. But the stories that I really love are the stories of ordinary people that do something great. Like the story of Rosa Parks. Rosa was tired from a full day, from a full day's work, and she boarded a bus in Montgomery on December 1st in 1955, and forever became known as an ordinary person that changed the world. When she refused to obey the driver's order to give up her seat and to move to the back so a white person could sit there, she was arrested for civil disobedience. And her act of defiance and the Montgomery bus boycott that followed are recognized as pivotal, important moments in the civil rights movement. She was just an ordinary person. And then there is the story of Todd Beamer and the passengers of Flight 93. Uh, They were ordinary people that fought back against 9-11 terrorists. Todd Beamer was just an ordinary, everyday account manager. And along with the other ordinary passengers on Flight 93, they realized that their plane was being seized by terrorists. And they worked quickly and courageously to reclaim control. Now, unfortunately, their plane did crash and they died uh, in Pennsylvania. But the passengers' brave resistance galvanized America at its darkest moment since the attack on Pearl Harbor. And then lastly, there was the ordinary, everyday mom known as Candy Leitner. And she stood up against drunk driving. After her 13-year-old daughter was killed by a repeat DWI offender, Candy founded Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which was MAD, in her home on March 7th in 1980. And before MAD, 
There were little to no legal consequences for driving while intoxicated. And thankfully, her organization transformed American attitudes about drunk driving and successfully fought for stricter laws across the country. These are just ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And I love these stories of these people. And then when you look at the Bible, you will see that throughout the entire Bible and throughout all history, God has used ordinary people to do extraordinary things for his glory. And that's our big idea for today is that God can use ordinary people to do extraordinary things for his glory. And we're in the middle of our verse by verse expedition through the book of Acts. And through this study, we are seeing that uh, the, key, the start of the capital C Church of Jesus Christ and how this book should inspire us and motivate us to get after it and to be a church in motion. And today we're diving into Acts chapter four, verses 13 through 22. And last week, we got to see Peter and John face some opposition as they preach the gospel. And despite that opposition, they continued to preach the gospel to the religious leaders that opposed them. And today, we are going to see the religious leaders that they preach the gospel to perplexed that these ordinary men were speaking so boldly. And what we will see is that as we get after it, for the expanding of the kingdom of God, God can use ordinary people to do extraordinary things for his glory. And I want us to ask ourselves a question. Do you desire for God to use you for his glory? Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you that you are here with us as your people today. God, we thank you that we get to gather together to worship your name, to learn from your word, and to spend time in prayer together. And Lord, I just pray uh, that we would grow in knowledge today of your word and through the growing of that knowledge, uh, we would apply it to our lives and become closer in our relationship with you and that we would be a better, brighter light in this world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so without further ado, let's dive back into Acts chapter 4, verse 13. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. So last week we finished with verse 12 and verse 12 said, there is no salvation and no, and no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And if you remember, Peter and John, they were being full, bold in the face of opposition. That they, they spent the night in jail, they were on trial with the 71 religious leaders, and they were boldly preaching the gospel. And then we see in verse 13 that the religious leaders observed the boldness of Peter and John. They, they noticed their boldness. And I mean, how could you not? You put the person that they were preaching about to death. You have the power to make an example of them. And yet they are preaching to you that you needed to turn to faith in the one that you had crucified. Your imprisonment didn't scare them. Your intimidation tactics didn't scare them. And none of this was working. And these religious leaders were seeing this, this boldness from the apostles. And then the religious leaders realized that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed. So Peter and John, they were just ordinary guys. Before Jesus chose them as apostles, they were fisher fishermen. And I don't know if you've ever been to Florida and been on a fishing charter boat, but the boat guides, they are usually some of the nicest people that you will ever meet. And they know a lot about fishing, but they aren't normally educated scholars that are trained in theology, okay? And this was the same for Peter and John. They were fishermen. They weren't educated. They grew up in homes where they couldn't even afford education. That's why they became fishermen. Yet here they are standing before the highest level of the religious council with knowledge of the scriptures. Remember, we have seen Peter quote scripture after scripture after scripture and, and show that all scripture pointed to Jesus. And they were standing in some of, in front of some of the most educated men in the world at the time. And they were being used by God. And I don't know if you knew this, but some of the most influential people of all time in the Christian world did not have college degrees. Charles Spurgeon did not have a college degree. 
he did not go to seminary. Yet he's called the prince of preachers and outside of Jesus, who was the king of preachers, is regarded as the greatest preacher of all time. And we have two of his books for sale in our book corner right now. And then D.L. Moody. Anyone ever heard of D.L. Moody? Dr. Moody? He also didn't have a college degree. His formal education actually ended after the fifth grade, yet he was one of the most influential people in the Christian world. And during his days, he was internationally renowned. Moody often spoke to audiences of 10,000 to 20,000 people. He presented the plan of salvation by voice or pen to at least 100 million people. D.L. Moody is considered by many as the 19th century's Mr. Protestant. And now I'm not advocating that Christ's followers should be uneducated, okay? The author of Acts was Luke. Luke was a doctor. He was clearly educated and God used him. And then we saw all throughout scripture where God used the apostle Paul. And it said that by the time the apostle Paul was 21 years old, he had the equivalent of two PhDs. Then look at people like Augustine and Martin Luther and Billy Graham. All of these men were highly educated. But this is the beauty of how God uses people. God can use PhDs, think Paul, the GEDs, think Peter, the doctors, think Luke, and the tax collectors, like Matthew. But in these verses through these past few weeks and today, God used Peter and John, these ordinary, uneducated men, the GEDs. God used them to heal a man in the name of Jesus that was crippled from birth. God used them to preach the gospel to a crowd where 2,000 people came to saving faith in Christ. God used them to preach the gospel to the highly educated Jewish leaders that had put Jesus to death. And listen, God can use you. And you may never get the chance to receive formal training in the study of Scripture, but be encouraged. God can use you. You may have a past that you aren't proud of, but so did Peter. He denied Christ. Yet as we are seeing today, God still used him and God can use you. You may think that you're not talented enough. You may think that you aren't good enough. You may think that you are too old. You may think that you are too young. I want you to hear this today. God can use you. God does not desire to use people that are impressive. He desires to use people that will be faithful and obedient. And Peter and John were obedient. They were all in. They were committed to following Jesus. They were committed to listening to Jesus. They were uneducated. They were not impressive. Peter had messed up, but God still used him and God can use you. God can work through you if you will follow him in faithful obedience. Wherever God has placed you, God can use you, an ordinary person, to do extraordinary things for his glory. If you are a stay-at-home mom, God can use you. He can use you to raise up children that will be world changers for the sake of the gospel. If you're a police officer, God can use you to be a light and to do good in our communities. He can use you to share the gospel with your fellow officers and to help institute justice that is so desperately needed in our communities. If you're in the trades, God can use you to be a light. He can use you in a way to do business with integrity and honesty, which is lacking in so much business today. He can use you to be a light to your fellow tradesmen and to be a messenger of the gospel to those you do business with. If you've been in the trades, you know that there are many men out there in the trades that need Jesus. Wherever God has placed you, if you will be faithful and obedient to Christ, he can use you, an ordinary person, to do extraordinary things for his glory, just like we see him today doing with Peter and John. They were ordinary fishermen. They were uneducated. They were not impressive, but they were faithful and obedient to Jesus in all of the extraordinary things that Peter and John were doing as ordinary people did what? It amazed the religious leaders. And they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. So the end of verse 13 shows the quote-unquote secret sauce to being used by God. 
Peter and John had spent time with Jesus. And those religious leaders could see it. How many times have people said of us, I can tell that you've been spending time with Jesus. People will say of me, oh man, this man has been spending a lot of time watching ESPN because he knows all the things going on in the sports world. Or, oh, this man spent a lot of time watching college basketball this last year because his March Madness bracket is not broken. It's great. They'll say, oh, this man has been spending time becoming a better fisherman because he's always posting on social media all the large bass that he's catching. And not that that is bad, but man, my desire should be for people to say more, oh, this man has been with Jesus. And these religious leaders made that connection with Peter and John. It was clear to these leaders that these men belonged to the group that had followed Jesus. And yes, they got to physically be with Jesus before he ascended to heaven. But church, we have access to Jesus. We have the word of God and we have prayer. How much time are we spending with Jesus? How much time are we spending seeking him throughout the week? How often are we consuming the word of God? How often are we on our face crying out to the Lord in prayer? Are we spending our time doing so much of things of this world or are we spending time with Jesus? And when we spend time with Jesus, every aspect of our life and work will be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And our submission to Christ will be evident to others by what we do and how we do it. Charles Stanley once said, the amount of time we spend with Jesus Meditating on his word and his majesty, seeking his face, establishes our fruitfulness in the kingdom. We must spend time with Jesus so that our words will resemble the words of Christ. We must spend time with Jesus so we can gain direction from the Lord about how he can move forward in every area of our lives. We must spend time with Jesus until we get wisdom from God about how to respond to the problems that we are facing in life. We must spend time with Jesus until we can hand that difficult person the fruit of the Spirit rather than a piece of our mind. We must spend time with Jesus until we can stand firm with spiritual boldness like we see with Peter and John. We must spend time with Jesus until every area of our lives radiates with the light of Christ. We may be ordinary people like Peter and John, but God can do extraordinary things through ordinary people that have spent time with Jesus. And this is exactly what we're seeing in these verses today with Peter and John. Let's dive back into verse 14. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So, The religious leaders here, they saw the man who had been healed standing with them. They had seen this man, this beggar, year after year at the gate called Beautiful, begging for money. And this same man is now jumping and leaping with joy. This same man that was healed in the name of Jesus was praising the name of Jesus and was now attached to these crazy, radical, insane Jesus followers. And the religious leaders were what? Dumbfounded. This miracle stood as a genuine miracle. And they had nothing to say in opposition. Like, like what could they have said? Healing and salvation in the name of Jesus obviously worked. And I love this because this shows us that converts shut the mouths of adversaries. The good done by the gospel will always leave those that are in opposition left dumbfounded. When people have been radically changed by Jesus, there is absolutely no argument. When an alcoholic is saved in the name of Jesus and set free from addiction, those that are in opposition to the gospel are left dumbfounded. When those that are in a broken marriage that is heading for divorce come to saving faith in Christ, and their marriage is restored by the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, those that are in opposition to the gospel are left dumbfounded. And my, oh my Lord, may we see these types of conversions here at Christ Community Church. 
May, may we see these types of restorations take place. May we see those that are bound to addiction set free in the name of Jesus. May we see God, go, may we see God perform miracles in accordance with His will that will bring Him and Him alone the glory. May we see the worst of the worst come to saving faith in Jesus. May we see God do extraordinary things through ordinary people, offer His glory, and shut the mouths of those that stand in opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just like we see in these verses today, the religious leaders had nothing to say in opposition. Converts shut the mouths of adversaries. Let's reread verse 15. After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves. This is like when you get brought into HR and you leave and then the HR leaders have to come together. They have to come confer amongst themselves, right? But the Sanhedrin was the religious council and they ordered them, being Peter and John, to leave. The council needed to confer amongst themselves. They needed to come together as leaders to discuss what they were going to do. Now, something to think about is, is how did Luke, who was the author of Acts, gather the information of the conversation we're about to see take place? The Christians didn't have any active members in this meeting. So, so how did Luke get this information? Well, in Acts chapter 6, a few chapters later, which we'll get there eventually, Lord knows when, but we'll get there. Um, Acts 6, 7 said, So the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number. And look at this. And a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. So there is no doubt that Luke gathered this information from one of these priests on the council that later became obedient to the faith. Meaning, Priests from this council that were standing in opposition to the gospel came to saving faith in Christ. And these ordinary people were stacking up those conversions to the empowerment of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God, baby. Conversions were taking place as the church was boldly proclaiming the gospel. We're going to see that next week at Easter, amen? We're going to boldly proclaim the gospel and see people come to saving faith in Christ. These everyday, ordinary people, empowered by the Spirit of God, were boldly proclaiming the gospel and seeing conversion after conversion after conversion after conversion take place. The good old simple gospel has power. Then verse 16 said, saying, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. This is actually an exact replica of a conversation that these same leaders had about Jesus while Jesus was on earth. Back in the Gospel of John, in John eleven forty seven, it said, So the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin, the same group of people, and were saying, What are we going to do? since this man is doing many signs. So these Jewish leaders had to figure out what to do with Jesus because of the signs he performed. They thought that they had resolved this issue when they had Jesus crucified. LOL. Now, these radical Jesus followers, Peter and John, were now performing miracles in the name of Jesus. And they asked amongst themselves, what should we do with these men? They had to figure out how they were going to handle the situation. And their track record of dealing with Jesus was just to create more threats. That's all they could do. And back in, if you remember in the Gospel of John in chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, uh, after Lazarus was raised from the dead, the religious leaders tried to kill Lazarus again. They couldn't deny the miracle of Jesus raising the dead, so they issued more threats. And they couldn't deny that the miracles were taking place. This verse said, For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. They could not deny that Jesus performed miracles. 
They could not deny that Peter and John were performing miracles in the name of Jesus. And they could not deny that Jesus rose from the grave. And we'll see in the next verse that all they could do was issue more threats. I would have loved, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in this room with these leaders. We have these enemies of Jesus conferring amongst themselves and basically saying, well, boys, what are we going to do now? We put Jesus to death, but now his followers, these ordinary, everyday people, are performing extraordinary miracles in his name, and now the number of their followers is only increasing. So boys, nothing that we're doing is working. Has anyone been there before? <laughs> you ever been in a situation that you that 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 nothing that you were doing was working? Parenting can feel like that. If you have a three-year-old in the house, you don't negotiate with a terrorist. But you'll have a child where it seems like nothing that you are doing as a parent is working. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, no matter what, they continue to do what they want to do. We just had the situation last week in our household. A specific child, and it's probably not the child that instantly came to your mind, okay, kept getting into the pantry and eating all of our sourdough bread. All day. Like, the kid would not stop. And Madison and I set this kid down. We clearly explained that they were not to get into the bread. They were not to get into the pantry. I mean, listen, through words and actions, we made it clear, okay? So I know some of you are judging. There's some action you need to take. I took the action, okay? I took it. Yet this child was in the pantry an hour later getting more sourdough bread. And it can sometimes feel like no matter what you do, it does not work. They need Jesus. It, and, and this is exactly what was happening with the religious leaders. They needed Jesus. No matter what they did, it was not working. They and nobody else will ever be able to stop the mission of Jesus. And what we are seeing here is the wickedness in the hearts of fallen people that have clearly seen the manifest power of God in their midst not be able to deny it, but attempt to thwart it. They were clearly corrupt in their hearts like all of us were before we came to saving faith in Christ. They were acknowledging that this extraordinary miracle happened through these ordinary people, yet they refused to submit to Jesus the one who ultimately performed the miracle. Let's go back to verse 17. But so that this does not spread any further among the people. Another LOL right there. Let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So this verse starts with, uh, so this does not spread any further among the people. The fear that they had about preaching Jesus was not rooted in a desire to protect the people. The fear that they had was rooted in their own sinful self-interest. These religious leaders loved their power. They were acting out of fear of their own futures rather than out of fear of God. And there's a sign in there for us. We must fear God, not, we must have a fear of God, not a fear of man. And these religious leaders saw that these ordinary people were being used to do extraordinary things, things that were greater than any of these religious leaders had ever experienced. And they knew that people would stop following them and would start following these lowly, ordinary fishermen. People would start following these radical Jesus freaks and they would lose their power. They didn't want to lose their power and influence. They should have been asking what must we do to be saved? But instead they were asking, what must we do to keep our own power? And what did they resort to? They said, let's what? Threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name being the name of Jesus again. This is absolute comedy. Like, like guys, your threats didn't work before. Why do you think that what you're doing is going to work now? 
And sometimes I wonder if those in politics took their training from these religious leaders. Like, what you're doing is not working. And they pulled Peter and John back in in verse 18 and said, so they called for them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. The religious leaders brought them in and said they are not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They could not deny what was happening in the name of Jesus. They couldn't deny the extraordinary things that were happening to these ordinary people through the power of Jesus. Yet they were seeking to halt the spread of Christianity at all costs. They were wanting to protect their status as religious leaders, even at the expense of obvious truth. And Peter and John, they were smack dab in the face of tyranny. And Jesus warned them in the gospels that this would happen. Jesus said in John 15, 20 through 21, remember the word I spoke to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But they will do all these things to you on account of my name, because they don't know the one who sent me. Did you catch that at the end of verse 21? Jesus said they will perform all these threats because they don't know the one who sent me. The religious council was made up of priests, elders, and experts in the Mosaic law. Their job was to enforce the law of God that God gave Moses, and yet Jesus said they don't even know God. Yet Peter and John and all these ordinary people that made up the early church, they knew God. They knew Jesus, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And we've seen the boldness of Peter and John these last few weeks. We've seen that these ordinary men did not have fear of people. So I think we can know what to expect now in verse 19. Let's go to verse 19. Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. I just, I love, absolutely love the way that the spirit, that the spirit filled Peter worded things in Acts. Like, like we've seen him be respectful of these religious leaders, but his words have a way of making this, these religious leaders look like absolute morons. But it's so respectful. Peter, Peter and John said, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. So before they gave them their answer of what they were going to do, they present this in a manner of, so you religious leaders, you tell us to obey God. You can decide for yourselves if it's, if it's better for us to obey God or to obey you guys. Ball's in your court. You guys that are egotistic rulers that don't even know God, you, you, you make the decision. And it was clear that they should listen to God instead of man. Peter here is making an effective appeal to this truth. They're getting ready to tell the religious authorities that they no, rec no longer recognize their authority. They now follow God directly. And like we saw last week, this is another mic drop moment from Peter. Let's go to verse 20. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Peter and John were unable, unable to stop speaking about Jesus because Jesus gave to Peter and John and the entire church a mandate, and it's our mandate called the Great Commission. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So spreading the name of Jesus was their assignment from Jesus himself. And it's our assignment. And we are now seeing Peter and John in the worst possible ethical conflict. They were in a conflict between two ruling authorities. This is like when a, when a child comes to mom and asks for a piece of chocolate and mom says no. What does the child do? The child runs off to dad, says, dad, can I have a piece of chocolate? And if you're like me, you say, go ask your mom. Peter and John were stuck between an obedience to either God or the religious leaders. And when it comes to situations like this, okay, we must know this. We are to obey those in authority unless that authority commands us to do something that God forbids or forbids us from doing something that God commands. If any authority on earth comes to a Christian and tells him that he may not pray, he may not read the Bible, he may not preach, he may not worship, he may not call sin a sin, he may not share the gospel, or do any of the things that God commands, 
then that goes against what God commanded us to do. And then that Christian may not only disobey, but they must disobey. But with that said, we must be sure that we have the clear teaching of the word of God on our side before we take a stand against the authority of the government. Peter and John knew what they were commanded by Jesus to do, and they were going to obey him at any cost. If you are ever faced with a decision in which you must obey God or the authorities, you can be certain that obeying Jesus is always the right path to take. And doing so can be risky. You may lose your status. You may lose your position. You may lose friends. You may be in prison. But disobeying God's explicit word is never an option. Obedience to the word of God is a requirement for those that they are, for those that claim they are a follower of Jesus. Regardless of the cost, we are commanded to obey the explicit word of God. Let's reread verse 21. After threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. The religious leaders continued to threaten them further and then they released them. And just to show that the religious leaders cared more about the opinion of man than the opinion of God, the only reason they released Peter and John was because why? The people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. They were unmoved by the miracle of God. They made their decision because of the public opinion, but we did see that there are priests that come to saving faith in Christ. And notice, who was receiving all the glory through this? The people were all giving glory to God. Peter and John, these ordinary men, were being used by God, not for their own glory, not to make themselves well known, not to make themselves look good. No, God used these ordinary men to bring himself glory. The miracle that took place, the people that came to saving faith in Christ, Peter and John being put in prison and speaking to the religious leaders, God took this entire situation and he received the glory for it. In our lives, when we are used by God, it is not for our own glory. It is for the glory of God alone. Everything that we do should be done for the glory of God. The Latin term for this was made well known by the reformers and it was called soli deo gloria, meaning to the glory of God alone. This should be our mantra. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. In Christ's followers, there should be no selfish ambition. If your aim to be used by God is to be well known or to receive glory, You have it all wrong. Our aim as ordinary people to do extraordinary things for God is to bring God glory. The glorification of self should not be amongst Christ's followers. In today's story, all glory from the people was given to God. In our church, in our lives, in the capital C church, may God and God alone receive the glory. May no man be put on a pedestal. May no man receive glorification. Friends, it's not about us. It's all about Jesus. So say it with me. Soli Deo Gloria. To the glory of God alone. May we as a church seek to bring God and God alone all of the glory. Let's go to the final verse for today. Verse 22. For this sign of healing had been done, had been performed on a man over 40 years old. So the story ends with a reminder that this man that was healed was a man over 40 years old to show that there was no earthly way at this point that he could spontaneously heal through natural means. It was done by Jesus and Jesus alone. So we've made it through Acts chapter 4, verse 13 through 22, and we saw the religious leaders that Peter and John preached the gospel to perplexed that these ordinary, everyday men We're speaking so boldly. And well, hopefully what we learned is that as we get after it for the expanding of the kingdom of God, God can use ordinary people to do extraordinary things for your glory. If you are in here today and you're sitting on your gifts and your talents because you are afraid of your past or you feel like you're not good enough, I'm telling you, if you submit to the Lordship of Christ, 
he will use you for his glory. And just a few things um, as we get ready to close. This is what we saw from Peter and John in these scriptures today. What, we, what to do and to remember is God uses us. One, we must be bold for Christ. We cannot back down. We cannot be afraid. This is what we saw with Peter and John. As God uses us, we must be bold for Christ. Two, we must have closeness with Christ. If we desire to be used by God, we must remain close to Christ. We must read the Word of God daily. We must be in prayer daily. We must spend time in the presence of Jesus so that every part of our life radiates the life light of Christ. Number three, we must remain obedient to Christ. We must remain obedient to Christ. We saw this with Peter and John today. Despite what they were facing, despite the opposition, and despite the potential of being put to death or in prison, they remained obedient to Christ. And then lastly, we must aim, as everyone stands to their feet, we must aim for the glorification of Christ and Christ alone. We cannot seek out our own glory. Our aim must be to bring God and God alone the glory. God can use anyone who obeys Him, spends time with Him, is willing to be bold for Him, and desires to bring Him glory. Soli Deo Gloria. So I want to ask ourselves a few questions in your life as we go into this final song of worship and this time of prayer, just some things for us to pray about. Where in your life are you needing to be more obedient to Christ? Ask yourself, am I spending time with Christ on a daily basis to where every part of my life radiates with the light of Christ? Ask yourself, am I truly bold for Christ? And then check, let's all check our hearts this morning. Is our goal to bring Christ's glory and Christ's glory alone? Whether it be getting that promotion at work, whether, whether it be coming on stage to sing on the worship team, what, whether it be maybe your desire to be a pastor in the future. I mean, whatever, whatever. Check your heart. Is my desire to glorify myself or to glorify God and God alone. And today I urge all of us to turn to Christ. Be like the 2,000 people that came to saving faith. Peter said in Acts 4.12, there is salvation and no one else, for there is no, under, no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. So today I encourage you with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you have never came to saving faith in Christ, I encourage you today, I, I, my prayer is that God would draw you unto himself, that he would call you, unto himself, and that you would ask God to forgive you of your sins. And I encourage you today, just talk to him. I'm not going to lead you through a prayer. This is a personal thing between you and God. And I encourage you today, repent of your sins, meaning you're telling God that you desire to turn away from your sins that kept you separated from him and declare that Christ is Lord and you will be saved. So I encourage you today, come to saving faith in Christ by repenting and declaring that Christ is Lord. So, Father, we come to you today. And God, I pray that as we get after it, that God would use us, these everyday, ordinary people in good old Clay County, Indiana, to do extraordinary things for your glory, Lord. God, would you do extraordinary things in our church? God, would you do extraordinary things in our personal lives, all for your glory, Lord? God, I pray that we would desire to see conversions take place here at CCC. God, that, that you would change the lives of many through the power of the gospel. We pray over Easter Sunday next week, God, as, as we preach the gospel, we pray that, that you would draw and call many unto you, Lord, and that many would come to saving faith in Christ and Christ alone. God, I pray that we would have a fear of God and not a fear of man. I pray, Lord, that we would be bold for Christ, that we would desire closeness with Christ, that we would remain obedient to Christ, and that our aim would be for the glorification of Christ. And God, specifically throughout this holy week, God, that you would be glorified through all that we do as a church. Our Good Friday worship service, our Easter Sunday gathering. God, through it all, that you would be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that wraps up our sermon this week. We hope that you enjoyed. If you're in need of prayer, you can email me at pastor at christcommunitychurch.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Instagram at mycccbrazil.com.
We pray that you have a great week.